Well, in honor of those people who've actually come here on time, we're going to, we're going to start on time. Um, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm Joe Smith, Chief uh, Medical and Science Officer for uh, West Health. I'm uh, delighted to have you here today. I, I know this is uh, a meeting about um, M Health, where M is supposed to stand for mobile. I'll tell you that it also, in part, has to stand for money, um, because given the, the, the state of affairs of healthcare expenditures uh, in the U.S. And, and around the world, um, the, uh, the relative attractiveness of a solution now at least depends in part on the economics associated with it. And so that's why we've, uh, we've titled the session um, a bit about, uh, if, if my slides actually show up, a bit about can we spend less. And so I, I know we're working through that. Because I've got, I've got really quick, really cool slides. You're going to love these. So let me, let me back up here to get us started. There's something at the beginning. There we go. Can we, can we spend less? And so um, this, is, uh, this is in part the notion that um, an existential threat for my organization is uh, we have to lower the cost of healthcare. That's why we exist as an organization. And so we're quite excited about uh, the notion of mobile technologies playing a role as a tool um, that can help us all to do um, the triple aim, if you like, but um, perhaps more focused uh, our mission is lowering the cost of, of healthcare. And so you have no doubt all seen, unless you live in a cave, um, there has been a fair bit of discussion about the upcoming uh, fiscal cliff. And you may think that that's one of the scariest things that can happen to you. Um, I'll tell you that that necessarily isn't the case. This was the scariest thing that happened to me. Um, I got listed in Health Leaders ma Magazine as one of the 20 people trying to make health care better. And when I went down the list, I realized that of the people I could recognize, I'm the only one who still has their job. <laughs> and so um, I, I do think the fiscal threat, uh, the fiscal cliff is a, is a real threat, um, but it will uh, attack many in terms of their ability to hold on to their jobs. And so uh, I feel that threat very personally. Um, so this is my only advertisement about um, our organization, West Health. It's an independent um, nonprofit uh, organization uh, specifically built to uh, lower the cost of health care. It is now evolved into four separate organizations. We're a, a nonprofit medical research institute. We're an investment fund where all of the resources flow back to the endowment. We're a policy center here in D.C., uh, and we're also a small company incubator. And it's all with the single mission of trying to lower the cost of health care in the U.S. And the problem that we're addressing is the one below it. You can see that in reality we spend about $2.8 trillion in health care. Um, we, uh, as a fraction of GDP, that number is now at about 18 percent, and it's, uh, it's rising. It's, it's, uh, it's actually a deviant economic variable. It's the only thing that's of any scale that's growing faster than the overall economy and has been doing so for the um, last four decades. And to, to actually add to that threat, as it turns out, we're all getting older, and so we have a bit of a demographic challenge as 10,000 people turn 65 every day and will do so for the next 20 years. And so um, we have an important challenge in front of us. The good news is that this meeting, this, this M Health meeting, um, if you look carefully, there's an awful lot of discussion about how the technology is really here to save dollars in healthcare. And we're going to have a meaningful discussion about that. This is the scary data, right? The U.S. healthcare spending is extraordinary. Um, we beat every other country on the planet in terms of healthcare spending by a lot. Um, you know, your, your next likely spending company is the, the country is the Netherlands at 12 percent, and we're at 18 percent, so 50 percent higher than our next nearest competitor, and about twice as high as the OECD average. But our health care outcomes do not match our health care expenditures. We're 49th in infant mortality, we're 50th in overall longevity, and so we deliver by any relative comparison a low-value health care system. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're all here is because we see the value of of M Health solutions to try to move us there. Um, this just quickly speaks to the notion that um, healthcare spending is squeezing out the other things we want to do as a country. We would love to be able to defend our borders. We would love to be able to educate our children. We would love to be able to have roads and bridges that don't have big holes or fall down. Um, but our ability to do all of those things is being challenged by our incredibly large and rapidly growing expenditure in healthcare. Uh, the majority of Americans, it's, it's not just that we spend 18% of GDP on health care, it's that each one of us spends 18 to 20% of what we make on health care. Um, and so as you think about this fiscal cliff, I want to draw your attention to a different cliff that's been predicted to occur, and that is by 2030, 
there will be a crossover between the amount of money the average family of four spends on health care and the amount of money the average family of four makes. And so put that in context. Every nickel that a family of four brings home in 2030 by rational projections will be spent in health care. Now, of course, that's not going to happen. Um, but what is going to happen is we're going to address the spending some way between now and then. Um, and if you've been following the fiscal cliff discussions and this, this notion of a sequester, if we don't do it in a nice, smooth, organized way, we're going to do it using big tools like axes and hammers instead of the surgically precise scalpels we'd like to use to fix health care. And so this uh, recapped in the recent IOM report points out that of the $2.8 trillion we're spending in health care, there's probably $750 billion or more that's, that we do so wastefully. But I will tell you that it's not waste you can find because every, every bit of it has an incumbent who's quite happy making a business doing just those things. And so there is an enormous opportunity, but it doesn't come real readily. And so I'll end my introduction along these lines. Um, you could either take these Time magazine covers and say that we are living in the best of times, as you would point to the wireless issue, and you would say, wow, the, the opportunity, the potential we have with wireless technology is apparently limitless. Or you could draw from the two on either side and point out that we're living in a remarkably subsidized economy um, and that um, we've already experienced downgrades and some suggest that if we don't figure out the fiscal cliff, we, we may be a candidate for two more of those downgrades as, in terms of our national debt. And so you could say it's the best of times or you could think it's the worst of times. I actually think the Greeks had a great word for this point in time, and that's keros, this notion of the supremely relevant time. This is a point where we can actually contribute to this national problem in a very important, very practical, very effective way with the technologies that are being showcased here if we can only demonstrate that they're a path towards saving money in health care as opposed to simply adding to the budget. And of course, our aging demographic provides urgency to what we're doing, right? Because we as a population are getting older, and you can even see it um, that, that uh, even our president is getting a bit grayer. And we may not have the next four years to be able to get this done. We may need to work even faster than uh, this, the current term. So we've, we've got our work cut out for us. It is an existential threat um, in terms of our national competitiveness, our national security. Um, and I, I don't think we're here just to sell more stuff. I think we're here to solve a problem. And this, I think, is a problem worthy. Um, we went ahead and uh, asked a, a bunch of people across the stakeholders of healthcare delivery to do what they could, write up what they could, could imagine as a strategy for saving money in healthcare. And so we went from the entrepreneurial community to the educators to the insurance companies. Reed Tuxen from United Healthcare wrote a piece. We've had economists weigh in. Um, we've had practitioners weigh in. We've had patients weigh in. And so this just got published. We've left it around the room for you to pick up. It's actually available online as well. Um, there is something that everyone can do, and we're, we're here to promote that notion of making sure that we actually get this done because it, it is undoubtedly a threat we need, to, we need to address. And I think, interestingly, we have many of the technology solutions that may well provide solutions. And so um, I'm, I'm going to sit down now and invite each of three speakers to talk. The first is Peter Newman, director of the Center for Evaluation of Value and Risk in Health at the Institute for Clinical Research and Health Policy Studies at Tufts Medical Center, also a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. And this, if you like, is a wordle kind of word blob of um, his most recent uh, publication in that, in that uh, supplement, and it's about the value of preventive screening. And I've asked, I've asked Peter to talk about um, how, how is it we'll know that we'll save money in healthcare, and what are the challenges to getting that done? The next, I'll, uh, I'll just introduce all three, is Neil Shah. Um, Neil is founder and executive director of Cost of Care and also a Harvard-affiliated OBGYN physician and surgeon. And you can tell by his word old blob that he's going to be talking about the role of the physician in, um, in helping to manage healthcare costs. Um, if you ask the med, med tech medical device community what is the most expensive piece of hardware used in healthcare, they may point to an MRI machine or a proton beam. It's none of those. It's actually the doctor's pen. And so we will not save money in healthcare unless we engage the physician community. And finally, Dr. Michael O'Grady, who's president of the West Health Policy Center. Um, Mike is, is a luminary of some point, actually being assistant, uh, I, think, I think assistant secretary at HHS at one point. So um, we're, we're delighted to have Mike here. Um, and this is a, a little bit of a word blob about, uh, about the policy center that you'll also find uh, in that supplement. And so with no further ado, I'm going to um, ask our first speaker, Peter Newman, to come and join us.
Well, good afternoon all to all of you, and thank you very much, Joe. Um, your picture of Obama was very frightening to me because I'm four months older than him, so the idea that he's getting so old is scary. So uh, thanks very much, and also thank you, uh, uh, Joe and Mike. I am the proud recipient of the uh, West Health uh, Policy First Fellow uh, Award, and uh, it's really a tremendous honor, and I applaud all the work you're doing and uh, really uh, look forward to seeing the work that comes out of the center and the institute in the years ahead. So um, I am going to talk about um, this question. Oops, I should get my slides up. I'm trying to advance. No. All right, well, I'll start. Uh, nope, that went too far. Okay, here we go. So, um, can we spend less on health care was the title, I suppose, uh, we're given here in the session. And let me um, start with a question. Which of these saves money? EMRs, disease management, prevention, better adherence, diet and exercise, all of the above? Oh, mobile technology, of course. All of the above or none of the above? Well, you can anticipate where this kind of question goes. Um, it really depends, of course, on what specifically we're talking about, on the incentives inherent in the system, on the target populations, and so forth. But none of the above may be the best answer to this question, in the sense that a lot of things that we hope purport to save money uh, turn out not to save money, or at least the story is very complicated for reasons that I'd like to discuss today. Um, EMR, disease management, prevention, better adherence, of course they can save money if used in a sort of targeted, smart way. But if you do careful evaluations of actual programs, uh, we often find that these kinds of interventions don't save money. And if you look at the Congressional Budget Office when they're asked to score or estimate the actual budget savings to the federal government, they've often balked at, at scoring savings. And Mike will come back to some of the nuances of budget uh, scoring and time horizon and what's included and not. But I think suffice to say, it's proven hard to save money in healthcare, even with interventions like the ones listed here, which seem like they should save money. Okay, so why is it so hard to save money? Let me offer, in my short uh, time here, 10 observations on this. First, I'll call it the healthy people are cheap illusion in the sense that there's a lot of evidence that, as we would expect, healthy people cost a lot less than sick people and certainly a lot less than chronically ill people with a lot of comorbidities. But the illusion is that if we could only uh, cheaply convert them from sick to healthy, we would save money. It turns out it's hard to convert people from being sick to healthy, and it costs money to do it. It's hard to change behavior, and on and on. So just because this is true, it doesn't necessarily follow that technology or interventions that I mentioned will save money. We'll come back to it. Two, the related point. The savings are easy if we only use nifty new technology illusion. Um, I was marveling at the technology downstairs in the exhibit hall and what I've been hearing today. It's very... Um, uh, you know, fascinating, uh, amazing to see it. Um, it doesn't mean there'll be easy savings resulting from it, even as there's a story behind every technology that will claim savings. And we'll come back to this. Um, three, there's a difference between cost effective and cost saving. Cost saving is a high bar. It means we actually spend money on something and we save money when we add up all of the co net costs and savings. We save money. Well, where in life do we spend money and, and expect savings, right? I mean, it's, we don't expect savings. You don't put money down when you go into the movie and say, I, I expect savings. You're spending money because you're paying value for your spending. And I think part of the um, way we need to think about this is we spend money because we get good value for our spending. At least we hope we do. And there's a lot of reason to think that we're not getting good value in in healthcare, as Joe suggested. But the idea that we want to actually save money is kind of a, a bit of a funny uh, concept, even as there are probably ways we can save money, and I'll come back to that. 
So in, in cost effectiveness class, we teach the cost effectiveness paradigm. And this is my only slide you're required to show one conceptual framework slide in academia. So this, this is mine. You have costs on the uh, y-axis, increased cost, decreased cost. You have health. I'll represent health in terms of qualities here on the quality adjusted life years in, in the uh, x-axis. So any intervention, new technology, anything else could land, has to land in one of these four quadrants. It either saves money if we can measure all the costs, and it either increases health or decreases health. It could be that the intervention is actually less effective and more costly than existing standard of care. It could be more effective and less costly. Or typically, it's more costly, but it's more effective. And this quadrant up here in the northeast is trying to capture, quantify the costs and the relative health of different types of interventions, with high numbers being more expensive ways to produce health, 100,000 per quality. Low numbers, more efficient or less expensive ways to produce units of health. And then, of course, you might be down there where you're actually decreasing costs and decreasing health, which involves some interesting trade-offs. So I have a couple of questions for you, and this is in part to make sure you're paying attention, but also to motivate the, the topic. If, imagine you have to um, make a recommendation on uh, different strategies for mammography screening. You are the, the um, aide to the Minister of Health or the HHS Secretary, and you're asked, which is more cost effective for population-wide mammography screening? Annual screening of women starting at age 40, or annual screening of women starting at age 50? Now remember, you're not being asked which of these produces the most health. That's an interesting question. You're at being asked, which is the most cost effective? In other words, which gives you the most health per the dollars you're spending? Okay, how many people say A? How many people say B? Okay, how many people don't know? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so we had a few A, mostly B. We're going to not tell you yet because we're going to get to some other questions and then come back to it, but this is great. Okay, a s similar kind of question. Again, we'll stick with mammography screening. And, and those of you, will, maybe all of you will know, these are not entirely hypothetical, right? We've had this big debate in the country about which of these is the best option. Not necessarily the most cost effective, but still we've had this discussion about it. Okay, so question two. Annual screening starting at age 50 or biannual, every other year screening start, uh, of women starting at age 50. How many people say A every year starting at age 50? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. And how many people say B, biannual, every other year? Okay, so more people seem to be saying B here, and the previous one more people said more cost-effective to start at 50 rather than 40. We'll come back. Final cost-effectiveness question. Okay, this is a little trickier. Now we'll switch to diabetes screening. Okay, we're giving you three options. Again, the most cost-effective, you're spending a pot of money for the dollars you're spending, which is giving you the most health. Screen healthy 35-year-olds, A. Screen 35-year-olds with hypertension, B. C, screen 75-year-olds with hypertension. Okay, how many people say A? Screen those 35 healthy years. Okay, a few of you. How many B? 35 with hypertension. Okay, a lot of you. Anybody C? 75-year-olds with hypertension. Okay, nobody likes C. And, you know, the intuition probably, I'm assuming, C, Screening older people is not going to be cost effective. They don't have as many life years to live. But b the most of you said B, perhaps you're thinking 35-year-olds with hypertension, higher prevalence, more targeted screening. These are people more likely to have or develop diabetes. All of these uh, screening models, and I won't go into detail today, um, are assuming that if you find the disease you treat, and there are assumptions about adverse events and cost of treatment and that downstream consequence. We can get complicated with the models, but that's, presume that's in there. Okay, I'm going to go a little faster because I want to get to the other speakers too, but my group has developed a, um, a database of cost effectiveness studies. We have eight, over 8,000 studies. There's our website, and you can go in and search on anything you like and all kinds of interesting cost effectiveness ratios in there. They're all in the form of dollars per quality. That's a strength. It's also a bit of a constraint, but that's what's in there. It's all from the published literature. We, we read it. We standardize it. And um, so let me just continue my 10 points. Number four, it costs money to change behavior. Okay, this is going back to why it's so hard to save money in healthcare. It costs money to change behavior. It's easy to say healthy people are cheap. It's easy to say diet and exercise are cheap. 
but it costs money to change behavior. And even when you spend money, it's hard to change behavior. It's really hard to change people's behavior. So we're getting to why it's so difficult. So you could have the niftiest mobile technology, but it's hard to change people's behavior, and it can cost money to do so. Uh, six, cost effectiveness depends on how well you target the intervention. So if we're spending a lot of money on a lot of healthy people, population-wide screening, and we'll come back to those examples, tends to be a lot less cost effective than very targeted. So if we're talking narrowly about motivated people, we're going to give technology to motivated people who will change their behavior, there's a lot better chance we're going to save money than if we have some kind of broad policy. Okay, so here I'm giving you some answers now. Which is co more cost effective for mammography? Annual screening starting at age 40, one analysis showed about $150,000 for every quality of life you're gained. Okay? It's not clear what the right threshold in terms of what we are willing to pay for a quality, but most people would say 50 to 100,000. These are population wide numbers. Okay? It's not saying everybody comes in and plunks down 150,000 on a population basis. Biannual screening every other year starting at age 50, 75,000. So I'm not giving you every option I gave you, but basically the intuition is if you screen starting later and you screen less frequently, it's actually more cost effective. Lower numbers are better. Why? You're going to pick up somewhat fewer cancers, but the cancers you pick up per dollar you're spending are going to be a much more efficient use of those resources. Okay? So starting at age 50, and doing it every other year is actually more cost effective. Now, two quick points. It's not to say that we shouldn't do it starting at age 40. It's just saying it's going to be a lot more expensive for the, can for the health years that we gain, number one. Number two, this, none of these are going to save money. We're talking about spending money to improve health. Mammography screening is is, seems not going to save money. It, it's a great thing maybe to do. I think we'd all agree on that. But there is a real economic question here. Okay, I'm going to go keep going. Prevention may or may not save money and is not necessarily more cost effective than treatment. Okay, that seems a little surprising, but my colleagues and I did a paper in the New England Journal where we go cr crunch the numbers. Some prevention saves money. A lot of prevention doesn't seem to save money, and I'm going to just skip through here. Um, here's the um, diabetes screening example. Unfortunately, none of you got it right. That's not bad. Most people don't get this right. It's counterintuitive. This study in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2000 did a model, and they said screening 75-year-olds with hypertension is actually the most cost-effective strategy compared to screening those 35-year-olds with hypertension, 87,000. 35-year-olds without hypertension is the least cost-effective. Why? You're going to screen a lot of healthy people who don't have diabetes. You're going to spend a lot of money on people for whom you're going to have no benefit, and that's how the model sort of absorbs those numbers and shows the results. So the, the point is, it's hard, to, and even the most cost-effective doesn't save money. We're talking about spending money here to gain health. Okay, final two points. Competing risks. It's, it's sort of the interesting and important and maybe obvious point that no intervention prevents death. And if we're honest about our accounting, we are going to keep people alive longer in costly and poor health. Now. That's, again, not to say that we shouldn't do this, but it is to say that we have to be honest about spending our society's money. And delaying death can be an expensive proposition, even if we discount those future life years and costs. Okay, final point. Um, gains are already partially harvested in a lot of uh, interventions, so immunizations. Um, it may well be that screening programs and vaccination programs and different kinds of... Um, you know, prevention programs are good things to do. Here are some examples. The problem is, if you're talking about immunization programs, we're already immunizing a lot of people. To go and get those hard-to-reach people, it tends to be a very expensive or relatively expensive proposition. Um, the marginal value for populations not yet served, um, costs may be higher, benefits may be less. So let me leave you with this. I don't think we should be depressed about all of this, okay? <laughs> That's not by intention by any means. Why not? Well, again, whether a technology saves money, it's really, on the one hand, not the right question. The question is, are we getting good value for our spending? 
and to hold up a bar that we need to save money, even as we have all the cost pressures and the urgent need to reduce the rate of growth of costs, we need to grow the economy, we need to spend our money wisely. But the idea that we're going to sort of reduce costs is going to be a high bar for many interventions. Now, having said that, there probably are tremendous opportunities for efficiencies, given the waste in the system, and even cost savings. But we need to make sure we target well, we need to make sure we have smart uh, interventions. And so I'll just leave you, beware promises of easy savings. There are great opportunities for efficiency, including mobile health technology, by the way. We generally save money when we reduce services and pay providers less. And by the way, changing incentives it does the most uh, to change behavior. So again, I applaud the, the work of the West Foundation. We need to change incentives. We need better infrastructure. We need to do a lot of things. And uh, we also need to do a better job at measuring this. So thank you very much. I'll look forward to your questions. Um, okay, well, I'm going to take a cue from Peter because I think our 3.30 mid-afternoon slot is the point in the infomercial where you grab your five-hour energy. Um, so, right? Like, that's like the clock is, like, ticking. Um, so uh, maybe we'll start off with some audience participation stuff. How many people here have direct experience with the American healthcare system, either as a clinician, a patient, or both? This is like establishing credibility of the audience. So everybody but that guy right there. <laughs> so uh, how many people think that it's the job of your physician, your nurse, or your caregiver uh, to provide you with high-value care? Raise your hand. Meaning the highest possible quality of care at the lowest possible cost. Uh, does anybody not think that? Okay, so keep your hands raised if you think that. This is part of the, part of the audience. Okay. So, of the people with your hands raised, keep your hand raised if you think healthcare in the United States is a good value. One or two people, despite Joe's slides, so that's impressive. But mo so, gener generally speaking, most people think that it is the job of physicians and other caregivers to provide patients with high value care. My employer certainly thinks so, as a doctor. Most physicians agree, and yet most Americans don't think it's a good value. So, of course, that begs the question: What's going wrong? Uh, and more importantly, what can we do about it? Um, I, you know, this is sort of a short talk, so I want to start by just sort of hanging out uh, three high-level points. The first is, this is a huge paradigm shift. When I was in medical school, which was not very long ago, uh, I was not only not taught about healthcare costs, I was specifically taught not to think about healthcare costs. But I'd like to argue that cost consideration is an inevitable aspect of uh, clinical decision making. It's going to be become a part of clinical practice. Uh, I think it already has become a part of clinical practice and it's going to continue to be. Uh, the second is I'd like to argue that there's an ethically coherent way for physicians and other caregivers to think about costs and care for patients at the same time. Uh, and the third is that, you know, thinking about costs adds a whole other dimension of complexity to an already really complex job. But I'm going to argue that we can do this in a pragmatic way, despite that complexity. So this is a picture of the hospital that I work in. Uh, Joe's familiar with it, because I think he also spent many hours, well, maybe not with this particular building. Uh, but you know, I spend about 80 hours a week taking care of patients. That's my job right now. I'm a resident, um, which is much like being an indentured servant. Um, and uh, you know, on the precipice of 2013, as I take care of patients in this hospital, the pressure on me to think about costs is coming from two different directions. It's coming top down from policymakers who want more accountability in how resources are being used, but it's also coming bottom up, uh, and this is new, I think, uh, from patients who want and are demanding more transparency in how we're spending their money. Uh, this is true around the country, but nowhere is it more true than in Massachusetts where I practice. Um, we were five years ahead of the rest of the country in terms of covering everybody. Uh, and now we are, uh, and you know, Peter is in the same boat as me. We're in the, you know, five years ahead in terms of running out of money. 
Uh, so this is a picture of Martha Coakley, who's our attorney general with her game face on. Um, and under her scrutiny, our hospital, which is considered to be one of the most expensive hospitals in the world, uh, is actively cutting hundreds of millions of dollars out of our operating budgets. At the same time, we're about to shift the way we pay for care, moving from a system where if you do more things as a physician, you make more money, to a system where you're, you, know, you have a fixed budget, you have shared risk with the payer for overspending on that budget, and you're meant to meet certain metrics of both quality and efficiency. Uh, and there are a couple of, of examples of this happening in fits and starts around the country on a private level, on a state level, on a federal level. Uh, but the most visible has been Medicare contracting with accountable care organizations, which means a lot of different things to different people. But as the Boston Globe put it, it means that the doctors at my hospital, at least the primary care docs, are going to start to be paid uh, more for total care rather than piecemeal. Now, as Joe pointed out, uh, he, he talked about this crossover point in 2013. Healthcare costs are increasingly eating up larger and larger shares of household budgets in the United States, r rising to rate about 10% per year. Uh, and I want to give you a cautionary tale from Massachusetts that uh, this is not something that the Affordable Care Act is likely to alleviate. Um, in Massachusetts, as you may know, or we're fond of bragging about, 98% uh, of our citizens have health insurance coverage. But since enacting um, our version of this health care reform, um, our medical debt rates are unchanged. They're not growing at the astronomical rate they're growing in the rest of the country, but they're not better. Uh, and there are currently more uh, insured non-elderly adults that are reporting difficulty paying their medical bills than ever before. How is that possible? Uh, well, of the about 400,000 people that we added onto our insurance ledgers, it turns out a lot of them are on high deductible health plans because they're cheaper. We didn't suddenly have a lot more money. Um, and uh, increasingly, we're at a time in the United States where there are more Americans than ever that are purchasing health care in a price-sensitive way. Because if you have a high deductible, you take the first couple thousand dollars in the chin. And so there are a lot of people uh, that are working on this in interesting places and interesting ways. But the states are working on it. So there's more than 30 uh, states right now that have legislation on the books to enable price transparency for patients. Uh, and in an era where consumers make purchasing decisions based on Travelocity and Yelp, uh, there's an expectation that we should be able to do the same thing for health care. And so there's hundreds of millions of dollars right now uh, in the Silicon Valley and places like it. In fact, uh, many of you may have heard of Castlight, uh, which is the one that has about $180 million in VC funding right now to create price transparency solutions for patients. And so this changes the environment that we practice in. Uh, our profession, the medical profession, just sort of took notice of this recently. Uh, and under the banner of this Choosing Wisely campaign that some of you may have heard about, uh, nine of the specialty organizations came up with lists of the top five tests that they decided are low value uh, and maybe shouldn't be done uh, and at the very least should be questioned. What's really radical about this is not only is it initiated within the profession, but they've partnered with folks like Consumer Reports and the AARP. And I'm, uh, Mike, I haven't really spent much time in DC, but I, my understanding is if you have the AARP on your side, you've already won. Um, so um, Bain and Company noticed the shift. Uh, there's not a lot that gets by them when there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are flowing into the private sector. Uh, and they put out a white paper called The New Cost Conscious Doctor, Changing America's Healthcare Landscape. They surveyed more than 500 physicians around the country. Uh, and it turns out that 80% of us actually do feel that it's our responsibility to control healthcare costs. Here's the problem, though. <laughs> Um, most of us have no idea how our decisions impact what either society or even the patient in front of us pays for care, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, but this was probably most uh, starkly demonstrated. Uh, there's a, a paper in the American, actually it's the Journal of Hospitals of Medicine two years ago, that hospitalists, who are doctors who spend all their time in hospitals, estimate the costs of routinely ordered tests. Their guesses were off by so much, they actually had to graph them on a log scale because they varied by orders of magnitude. Uh, and then, as Joe pointed out, uh, according to the Institute of Medicine, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, this is a quote from the former, former director of OMB, uh, we have in excess of $700 billion in waste and tests and treatments that aren't helping patients get better. Um, just to give you like an estimate of like what kind of money we're talking about, the DOD um, estimated that we spent about that much money on the Iraq War. So our annual expenditures and health care waste. That's, so that's awkward for me as a physician. And it, it, I think it begs this question. I don't think it's the case that doctors are being reckless. There's a lot of things in that 700, $750 billion number 
Um, and from a physician's perspective, one of the difficulties are that the healthcare system in the United States has a lot of different stakeholders with very different uh, levels of access to information. So uh, the people that are getting care, the people that are providing care, and the people that are paying for care often at any given time have a different idea of what the value of what's being provided is. And then the more fundamental issue for physicians is that doctors are trained to take care of the patient directly in front of us. We're not trained to assume responsibility for populations. What that means is when we hear $750 billion or 17% of GDP, that sounds bad, um, but it doesn't really inform what we're supposed to do for the patient in front of us. Which brings us to the reason why my medical school taught me not only you know, did they not teach me about cost, but they specifically told me not to think about it, um, which might be intuitive to a lot of people here, but there's sort of this perceived tension between the best interests of the patient in front of me and this sort of societal obligation to protect uh, our resources, to be able to protect our borders and do all the things that Joe talked about. That being said, they're not mutually exclusive goals, and I think that one of the ways to make this ethically coherent is to really delineate the motivation of patient affordability uh, and societal resource stewardship. There's some things that are good for the patient and good for society, and we don't even do that well. That's the stuff that we should be doing all the time. This is like generic drugs. Everybody wins. At the same time, uh, mm -hmm. there are things that maybe aren't so good uh, from either perspective that we still do anyway. This is like, in my field, uh, robotic surgery in uh, young, otherwise healthy women, or maybe hypertension screening at age 35. Um, and then there are the sort of the in-between in things that we need to think about more rigorously, and it's one of the things that my organization is, is working on. But uh, until we have sort of a coherent framework for thinking about these things, I think we can't move forward. Um, the other thing that I want to point out uh, from a systems level um, is that, you know, it's one thing to have an ethically coherent framework. It's another thing to be able to give doctors cost information, tell them what's appropriate with these top five lists and what's not. But all of those things are not likely to be sufficient. And the cautionary tale uh, comes from my field in obstetrics. Uh, there was an o Austrian obstetrician 150 years ago who figured out that if you washed your hands, you could cut infection rates and mortality from those infections in pregnant women in half. Semmelweis. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, that was 150 years ago, and it wasn't during my, until my time in medical school that people started washing their hands. And which might be disturbing to many of you. And I, honestly, we're not that great at it yet. Uh, but, um, you know, the inflection point in hand washing didn't come from people knowing that it was a good idea to wash our hands. It came from having a really good understanding of the incentives, uh, as Peter uh, sort of described, to not wash your hands. So what happened was they put Purell dispensers everywhere. They took it from a five-minute operation to a 30-second operation, they created a 360 degree feedback culture, there was no accountability, so now if I don't wash my hands, the nurse or actually the patient will call me out on it. Um, and so similarly, we need to be thoughtful about what those incentives are uh, in terms of overutilization of, of healthcare resources and really being comprehensive about it. So I would argue that most of the conversation right now about these incentives talk about reimbursement, mm -hmm. people doing more things to make more money, uh, or uh, medical malpractice, people doing things because they're afraid of being sued. Uh, in my hospital, one of the most expensive hospitals in the United States, all of the ordering uh, of tests happens uh, because of people like me, the indentured servants who do no, don't make more money for ordering more tests and uh, are protected from medical malpractice relatively. Uh, and, so, and yet we do it anyway. Um, so when you, when, you, when you start to be more thoughtful about it, you realize there's at least, depending on how you parse it, 10 to 20 other reasons why physicians overutilize tests. Um, the number one motivator for people like me is decreasing your future workload. It's about getting beds unoccupied. So a lot of times people are ordering tests just to preempt that future workload. Why get one test and then wait when you can get five tests and just not think about it again? Um, we exist in a culture where doing more is equated with being thorough, uh, and being smart is equated with being able to list every cause of a chief complaint where in the 1950s that meant listing five things and testing five things. Uh, in 2012 that means listing 50, maybe 500 things, and uh, we obviously can't afford to test for all of them. And uh, just fundamentally not understanding how healthcare costs are structured. So, uh, you know, the same MRI, I call this hospital myopia, but, you know, uh, we, we train physicians in hospitals and don't train them to think about what happens outside of hospitals. So the same MRI in our emergency room is twice the cost of an equivalent MRI as an outpatient uh, because of the overhead. 
and people simply don't realize that. Um, I just want to end also by making this point that, um, you know, there's a big role for information technology and mobile technology in helping physicians navigate this complexity. Uh, decision support has done a lot in improving patient safety, improving uh, quality of care, and I think the next iteration of this is going to be build in, building in systems that uh, also provide decision support around value. Um, and, you know, in 2012, uh, residents in the hospital look like that guy. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll wait a sec for the slides to come up. Uh, one question for Neil, though, while we're waiting. Uh, oh. When the hand washing started, was that when there was reimbursement for hand washing? <laughs> Am I supposed to do something, or does it just magically come up? All right. Click. Watch. Next. It's going to be a theoretical discussion today. I think he just needs the sex. So I don't I think we're good. I'll start out a little bit in general terms while we're just waiting for the slides to come up. Um, certainly there's been a lot of uh, focus now on thinking about slowing the growth rate trying to generate savings. Uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is kind of, of there's a number of times where you'll see that there are quite serious policy uh, battles over how you measure savings, how these things really happen. Uh, one example that you may remember from a few years ago, about four years ago, was when the president came in and he wanted to uh, move forward on health IT. Uh, and he had a good team of academics who gave him a cost estimate that it would save $77 billion over 10 years. Um, the Congressional Budget Office got a hold of that, ran their own parallel as assessment, and came up with $17 billion and felt that he should be grateful that they still had it as saving money, not costing money. So the President lost $60 billion he thought he had for health care reform and was fairly embarrassed. And uh, for any of you who have worked for secretaries or presidents or whatever, embarrassing the President is a bad thing for your career path. So. Um, okay. It's okay. If, if you catch up, we'll, we'll just slide through. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is in terms of, as you see this, as you've picked up from the other speakers, there's this ever-increasing impact of economic uh, factors, of what things cost, how they spend on clinical advances. So as we've talked about this, there's the things we already have, but there's also those things that we will have. Peter touched on this a little bit when he talked about cost effectiveness. This idea of one of the questions is we have new technologies, we have new protocols, we have new ways of doing things. And so far, at least on the technological side, there's been this feeling that all new technologies, unlike almost every other sector of the economy, actually increases spending rather than making things more efficient and decreasing and making things more efficient. So there's a question now that as we see and this pressure continues to build on both private and public budgets, there's a little bit more of uh, it's not just the same thing where if it's approved by the FDA, of course we'll pay for it. You're seeing a little bit more selectivity in terms of what does it really do, which is much of what Peter's work on cost effectiveness gets around to. Now so far basic science hasn't really been affected by this. But you will notice when you see NIH go to Capitol Hill and sort of argue for their, their budgets and whatnot, you're starting to hear much more of this, this extra, their, the, you know, their traditional way of doing it is they bring four or five luminary docs, they go up there, it feels like a, you know, a grad seminar, and it's, it's, it's very, you know, the clinical advances we'll be able to do. What you hear now is you hear that, and then you hear what this is going to do to the Medicare Trust Fund and how this is going to save and how if you're able to intervene in diseases like diabetes early, what you're liable to save on end-stage renal disease 20 years from now, what you're liable to save in terms of uh, treating blindness or, or other sorts of complications. So it started to creep more and more into the discussion. 
I have a great graphic at this point. <laughs> well, okay, this will this will be a test of how well I can kind of uh, give you a visual picture of things. If we think of the, the way that Peter laid things out there, we have one dimension that we've worked with for a long time, which is sort of clinically more effective, clinically less effective. And you think of different alternatives. What we currently do, and I, again, this is a, a drug, a device, a technology, uh, a protocol, however you want to think about it. This all kind of applies. And, and it's also what Neil was talking about, about you know you shouldn't be thinking about costs. And if you think about them, let's say we have three different interventions we could do. And each one is about 10% more clinically effective than the other. So if you're doing it in a, in a price blind sort of way of doing it, of course you're going to pick the one that is most clinically effective. Now when you look at the spending involved, it turns out the one that is the most eff clinically effective is 10 times as expensive as the one that is 10% less expensive. And the one, even 10% less, actually saves money. So now you're in a little bit more of a dilemma. That You'll see if you practice medicine, you can see how this is coming through in your patients, the way the insurers are dealing with things. So it's not a single dimension of more or less clinically effective anymore. It's how much more for how much clinical effectiveness you get, what are you doing in terms of your price, of your spend, if you want to think of it that way. So you tend to see things like pre-authorization. If you're going to do the most expensive thing, the people who have to pay for it want to know kind of clinically what can you justify why you're picking the most expensive of the three options, not the third one that actually saves money. You'll see step therapies, situations where you're in a situation where, well, why wouldn't you try, you know, it's, it's like when we take our cars to the mechanic. You have two things wrong with your car. One is a $200 repair. One is a $2,000 repair. He says, how about I do the $200 first, drive it for a week. If that does it, great. If not, come back and I'll do the 2000 so you're seeing a similar sort of notion. If there's a, you're, you, you know, we start with a generic antibiotic. If that doesn't work for 10% of the people, then we spend more on 10% of the people. We no longer spend 100% of the people with the most expensive thing because it is necessarily the one that will just sort of nuke the problem with the best clinical outcome. So it is that idea of you just, there's now another dimension to things that are going to go on in decision making, decision making for the patient, decision-making for the provider, and decision-making for the insurer or employer, the, the ultimate payer of the vast majority of the cost. Now, one of the things that Neil brought up about how physicians are trying to become more cost-sensitive, and I think we could all kind of think of different things, that when he had his cartoon about the 14 different prices, you know, we're guys who like technology. We can think of different ways that you could sort of have an electronic record that would not only say, as you went over to check off that hemoglobin A1C, it would come up and say $21.15, or, you know, it would say, you know, you, you, could, you could think of a fix there. The danger for the physician, I'd say, in that sort of environment is not so much that they have to keep track of all these things, but definitely, Neil's right, the patient is becoming more and more of a consumer, an aggressive consumer, a prudent consumer, and right now the patient tends to feel that their provider is on the same side of their, that is on their side in terms of their care. But if they come to the point where they view that the provider is on, the, their, on their side in terms of care, but on the opposite side of the table when it comes to paying for it, that's a breakdown of the relationship that probably most providers would not want to find themselves in. And so you want to be along with the patient in terms of doing that and not feel that you've suddenly got an a, a, a entrepreneurial business relationship that you're negotiating over price. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of the different ways that people look at the savings and the way they're done. Because this tends to be, back to my, my example about the president, part of this has to do with why some people will tell you this thing saves 17 billion over 10, and other people, all good people, all good estimators, will tell you 77. And it's not like one just made a big mistake. In the academic world, and Peter's one of the top guys in this, and so he's to be, to be lauded, there is this idea of cost-effectiveness analysis. And it's a, I don't know, good 10, 15 years sort of established sort of way of doing this methodology. It projects the natural history of a disease. It's got its basis in epidemiology. So you're looking at the transition states, how people progress over time. And you can, and you can take that in the same way, you know, I think we've all seen a, a zillion CDC studies where they're talking about hepatitis C or diabetes or whatever, you can then take that and also we know now, we have good data. If you say that that diabetic transitions to dialysis and end-stage renal disease, we know what that costs. Medicare gives us claims. We know that's $54,222. 
So you can model a disease progression, and you can attach to that what the, what the associated spending with it will be. You can follow that along. Now, what cost-effectiveness analysis tries to do is balance off that idea of a clinical improvement, how that will affect spending, and you have to take into account both sides. If you're introducing a new protocol or a new drug or a new device, you're definitely increasing spending. The question is, as time progresses, are you getting better clinical outcomes that generate less spending in the out years? And how does that then net out across the total? But you are kind of by definition adding spending in that first few years to the situation. Now the attempt to go into, cl into quality of life is certainly makes perfect sense. We can see in a policy world that gets a little dicey, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So as Peter pointed out, I think a number of times, oh, here we go, okay. Um, thank you very much. Can I go, uh, is it okay to go back to show my, my snappy, because uh, I really like this one. Okay. So this is, hopefully you got this conceptually when I, when I talk through it, I'm not sure. But as you can see, if you're, a, if you're a provider and these are your decisions, it's pretty much of a slam dunk of what you would do. Now when we bring cost in the town, now you see it's a different discussion. And so you can see, C is a hard one. That is, I've, I've flipped axes here to just throw you off in terms of the way Peter did this before. But it is the idea, C is the one that is both clinically effective and cost saving. B would be what Peter calls cost effective. It costs a little bit more, but you get, a good, you get a better clinical outcome. And it's in effect, I think he used the term high value, that it's sort of worth it to spend the extra money. A, for that increase in clinical, that increment, is that worth that much more money than C? I, at least you'd have to think about that one before you made that decision. Okay, so in terms of thinking about cost effectiveness, and this is sort of what I do. So this is typically used, the, the intervention does not have to be less expensive. It just has to be that notion of added value, that there's enough of, a, of, a, of an improvement in terms of the clinical outcome, in terms of the patient's quality of life, that it makes it worth that investment. Now in terms of, we, like I say, we don't do this in, in the public payers. We do not do this in Medicare. We do not do this in Medicaid. But on the private side, private insurers, Aetna, Humana, you know, those kind of guys, they tend to use this, and they tend to use a rule of thumb around $100,000, that for $100,000 of additional spending to give that one more good year of life, that one quality, quality-adjusted life year. The British are much tougher. The Europeans sort of fall in between here. So the British have a $20,000, or excuse me, £20,000, which is roughly $30,000, $31,000 threshold. So it's about a third of what the Americans have. Now, they have an exception that they'll go up to 30,000 pounds for, you know, really clinical blockbusters with, with good evidence to, to show that that's what it is. But it does have to have that kind of just, uh, justification. So this is used in policy actions to, to do coverage decisions. Like I say, this is sort of by governments in Europe and elsewhere. Australians, I believe, do it as well. And by private carriers come in the United States. Now, this is not the way policymakers do things. Not in the United States. Oops. Oh, these are actually the wrong slides. Boy, we're doing well. Um, okay. Okay. Well, well, this one is the right one, so we'll do this one, and then I'll go back to uh, visualizations. So anyway, so budget estimates. These are the ones that you're going to see commonly we you see in federal and state programs. Medicare, Medicaid, organizations like the Congressional Budget Office, if the analysis is being done for the legislative branch, and the Medicare actuaries if it's being done for the, uh, for the administration. Now, they project spending streams under current practice, what they call a baseline, or a current law baseline, as they often do, because we're talking normally here about a proposed change in legislation. You will cover something under Medicare or some other program like that, and the proposed alternative. So to a certain degree, there's a parallel there in terms of the way you think of disease progression and how we would measure in cost effectiveness. We have a current way of treating a patient, and now we have an intervention that is the, in this case, would be the, the alternative. Quality of life is not considered. It's not. This is a budget estimate. There's an old joke about that the CBO doesn't care whether it's a, a happy diabetic or a depressed diabetic. The question is how much is there, will they spend in the years to come? So. What it does is it does this, they almost always use 10-year estimates. Now that has a couple of, that's a historical. I mean, this, these, the same kind of estimates are done across the whole range of policy. So they're using a typical methodology. They're using certainly healthcare, healthcare spending, disease progression, 
But this is the same they'd use 10-year estimates for aircraft carriers. They use it for the school lunch program. It's a way to allow members of Congress to be able to compare across their choices and what their budget priorities are. So it has to be consistent. You wouldn't do a 10-year for one program and a 15 for another and a 5 for another. So they're constrained like that. It's also true they used to only do five-year estimates. They've moved up to 10, one, because their models got better, and two, because they realized committee chairmen had realized how to hide all the costs in the sixth year. It's a little harder to hide it in the 11th year. It can be done, but it's a little harder. Okay. Um, the only exception to this is the Medicare Trust Fund, which they're asked to do for 75 years. The Medicare actuaries are. I don't think any of them are going to, you know, bet their children's college education on how well they do in that last 25 years of those estimates, but that's what the law always asks them to do. Okay. Now do we still have the, I assume we still have the wrong slide? Yep. Okay. Give me one second to get the paper. Okay. There are three different that I would call key differences between these things and how it affects in terms of both policy and how people in terms of who are developing new technologies and would like them to be able to be picked up by these big government programs have to kind of think about things. The time horizon is the first. Um, the, the lifetime, normally a cost-effective analysis, which you would be developing if you were going to move something forward, like I say, a new technology, a new drug, a new device, you would be using cost effectiveness because you need that for your, your markets outside of the United States and you need that with, with private payers in the United States. It's normally either, Peter can correct me, I normally see either 25 year windows or lifetime. You run the patients all the way through versus the 10 year window. Now this is normally important in certain areas with chronic disease. The area I've worked in a lot is diabetes. If you, think of, if you just think anecdotally about the people you know who have diabetes, when they get that diagnosis, it's not like they go blind in two years. It's not like they go on dialysis in three. It tends to be in the 12th year, the 15th year, the 18th year of the disease. So if you have a new intervention, a new whatever, disease management, a device, a protocol, whatever it happens to be, you'll be adding costs in the early years. And you may be reducing costs in year eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, whatever. You, under this sort of methodology that's done in public policy, you will not get credit for any of those savings beyond the 10-year mark. So in many things, this is fine. 10 years is, pos is possible. It, wor it works in the vast majority of things. But when we think about things like chronic disease, this becomes, this becomes problematic. Quality of life measures. There's no quality of life measures uh, in budget estimates. It's only the spending that counts, and particular spending. If you look at some of the cost effectiveness stuff, things that have been pointed to as, as really savers. Peter brought up before vaccines. That's true, but if you look at a cost effectiveness analysis for things like vaccines, a lot of the savings there are things like parents' time that they don't miss from work, taking care of the kid who, you know, who doesn't get the flu or doesn't get the, again, you know, if they don't care whether the diabetics are depressed or not, they certainly don't care about some parent losing half a day. That's not something the taxpayers pay for. So many of those things in terms of what they're willing to pay for don't go in. That savings doesn't, an academic doing a cost effectiveness is trying to be comprehensive and therefore picks up all these different time, you know, absenteeism, presenteeism, these sorts of things. It's not going to happen in a policy realm. That's not something they're going to do. It's only that spending that, that counts. Now the other thing that is a, a major roadblock here and is a real shame is that the quality adjusted life year has, has sort of stepped on a, a societal landmine. It triggers, inter and part of it is misconception about what was going on, but many have underlined the methodology there is a notion of time trade-off. So you're saying to a patient, if you have hepatitis C, if you right now, if you could have, tw if you're going to live 20 more years, would you take 18 or more years and be free of your hepatitis C? Now, in, now that's a perfectly, all the academics are trying to do, all the modelers are trying to do is to get that feel for the real quality of life differences of having this disease, having, you know, being on dialysis, being blind, these different things. Unfortunately, it triggered a, a, a response that it certainly looked like, you know, someone was going to interfere with end of life decisions that were really up to a family, an individual, and the implication that a program like Medicare may get involved in people's individual end of life decisions meant that that's, that's one of the main reasons this methodology is not used in Medicare and Medicaid and other big public programs. 
So it would be nice, and it's a real shame, because there's other ways you could do that than time trade-off, uh, willingness to pay, other methodologies. Kind of, Peter can speak to whether they're equally rigorous or not, but you wouldn't have stepped on that societal, you wouldn't be rigoring up notions of death panels by the, the methods you use. So you do not see any of that kind of quality of life taken into account. What spending is counted? They really only care, in terms of in the policy sense, of what the taxpayers will spend. That's who they're take, looking out for. Budget estimates are more likely to, the one thing that they do, I would argue, better than the way you see in cost-effectiveness analysis is they take into account a little, cost-effectiveness analysis are often done in conjunction with a clinical trial. These sort of budget estimates are often done later in the process, so they can actually look at the claims. So you see things like, well, I have to say that in most of healthcare, when it comes to the insurers, nobody pays, it's like the diamond ad, nobody pays full retail. So if you're in a point in the clinical trial and you say, what is this new device going to be when it hits the market, and you go, you know, insulin pump, $5,000, Aetna doesn't pay $5,000 for an insulin pump. They pay maybe $3,500, you know. So, so there's a no, and, and so when you're doing a policy thing, you're not looking at what list price is. You're looking at the claims, and you're saying what was really paid. So in some sense, you'll look at certain things that look perhaps cost-effective but not cost savings if you do a cost-effective uh, cost analysis. If you do a budget analysis, they can even come in lower. The other thing that is not normally taken into account, I'd say, because of that clinical trial kind of environment rather than uh, actually out in the market, is there's all kinds of cost sharing on, on very, you know, whatever it is. My example of the $5,000 insulin pump, that's $1,000 in cost sharing for most patients. So are they going to replace it exactly when the FDA says, you know, 4.5 years? Hey, if it lasts five or six, they're going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to hold on to it. So again, that means that it really is a lower cost than you thought it was going to be when you were, you know, doing your cost effectiveness in conjunction with a clinical trial and tracking um, 300 people. So the question is, is certainly are we in a position where you can save money? Yes. Part of it is that price sensitivity that we don't currently have and that we're starting to get. Part of it is also how you think about new technologies, new interventions, new protocols. And one of the things that we don't normally see today is the question of are you replacing something else that is currently done that is more expensive? If you think of our friends at the FDA, and they're lovely, I, you know, they're, they're great. But if you look at the way, I used to do work on, on the cost effectiveness of blood you know, blood testing, HIV tests, that kind of thing, the, the, the safety of the blood. They have never, well, I shouldn't say that, that's overstating it. It's very, very rare to see an old technology is dropped off the list. You just, you know, if you have the test you did in 1965, you just add the one you came up with in 70, you add another one that came up in 85. And so what does that do? If you're only concerned about safety and efficacy, you think you're kind of being belt and suspenders. You're just making it that much safer. If you're thinking about it in terms of cost, if you never drop off the old technology and you just add on, you never get the savings associated with replacing those, that, that spend. And so again, that's a change in mindset. That as you think about, for those of you who are thinking about new technologies and how you bring them forward, that's how you sort of uh, are able to convince people that you're, what you're doing hopefully saves money or at a minimum is really just a slight increment up in spending for a significant increment up in clinical effectiveness. Thank you. So as you're running for the doors, this is a time when you can ask questions. <laughs> and we could ask some of you while you're leaving, but I, I won't embarrass you. Um, so um, I think we've, we've heard a bunch of things. We've, we've heard that um, the, the healthcare system, the, the way we're paying for it is demanding that we provide care for less. You heard Neil say that you know, the, the Attorney General in Massachusetts has told his hospital to spend hundreds of millions of dollars less. That the patients who are in these um, uh, intelligently designed benefit programs are finding that their high deduction is actually a high cost uh, for them. And so they're turning to docs and saying less. You're seeing that, that policymakers are facing you know, a big bogey in terms of what to do with the budget. Uh, and they've even deprived themselves of some of the tools that would nuance the capability to make appropriate decisions. If you're unwilling to uh, evaluate the quality of life associated with care, then you're really going to use a sledgehammer where a scalpel is perhaps more appropriate. 
And so clearly we've got some challenges. I think one of the bright spots is the notion that the docs who actually live with the nuances of clinical care and some of the vagaries associated with it are now feeling a bit compelled with the pressure from both above and below to actually make decisions which are a good deal more economically appropriate for their patients. Um, I, I have a, a question to get us started, and that is I couldn't help but notice, and maybe you did too as you wandered the floor, uh, how many people have really cool solutions to keep people out of the hospital, this notion of avoiding rehospitalization. As, as, um, as MedPAC started and then Medicare picked up the notion that, guess what, we're not going to pay hospitals for rehospitalizing re patients with a number of diseases. And in fact, that list that starts with heart failure and pneumonia is actually going to grow in 2014 and 2015. And so you see people hawking solutions that say, good news, I'm going to save you money. I'm going to save the healthcare system money by keeping people out of the hospital. So one of the discussions that we had before this was, so if you save a person from coming to the hospital, how much money do you really save the healthcare system? Because that, that hospital is still there. That bed is still kept lighted and warmed. The nurses who would have taken care of that patient are still kept employed. And so how much of this that we're all rallied around at the moment of decreasing health care expenses by keeping people out of the hospital, how much of that really matters? Or is there some quanta that you have to achieve? Do you have to send a doc home or a nurse home? Do you have to drive unemployment in the healthcare sector? Or do you have to close hospitals to save money? Or is there an opportunity in between? And so I'll, I'll, I'll open that up, and then, and then I'm going to ask you to ask the questions that you have. Okay, well, Ashish Jha, the physician at Harvard, has written about this and others too, but he has argued, and I think persuasively, that it's important to reduce readmissions, obviously, but it's probably not going to generate the say, big savings that maybe people hope or expect, in part because of the fixed cost problem, that you still have a lot of the same fixed costs, number one. Two, it's often hard to do, that, that uh, it's not so easy to just reduce admissions, even as there are certain, certainly some opportunities. It does perhaps create some other unintended consequences to keep patients in the hospital for their first day longer so you don't admit them later, and, and on and on. Um, there are probably other arguments he makes. And you know, the other point I made at the end of my talk, if, if we want to generate big savings, you know, typically we do that by offloading risk to patients and providers. That is, we make patients pay more, and we put physicians and providers on fixed budgets. And that does change behavior. Now, that may result in some readmissions, but it probably results in other kinds of things that matter more than just readmissions, reducing services, and again, just paying providers less. So, stop. Joe, in terms of just thinking about this for a second, I, I don't think you, you need to, you know, envision mass layoffs. We just have a healthcare system that grows extremely quickly. Um, maybe you're talking about a medium-sized city that has five or six hospitals. Just don't 10 years from now have seven or eight. Um, would help a lot. So, to a certain degree in, in your example, no, if they can't bill, if they go from 90% capacity, you know, it's sort of like the hotel business, if you go from 90% to 60%. Uh, certainly the last time we saw an overcapacity in hospitals, the insurers took advantage of it and got deep discounts to drive business towards one of the hospitals in the area. And that brought down the unit price. I, I think what we're realistically talking here is we have a wealthy country. We're in a bit of a recession now, no doubt about it. But generally our, our wealth grows, our GDP is faster than our inflation, and so we are getting to be richer every year. So if you're talking about a, the, but the underlying dynamic that is problematic is that our wealth grows at one rate and our expenses in health care grow at about two to two and a half times faster than that. Uh, that's the crowd out of elementary and secondary education. So you could still have good growth in the health care system, just not faster than our ability to pay for it. And then your, your percentage of GDP would be, would be basically like the Europeans and you would hold it. Or we would hold still and the Europeans would catch up to us which I, I would guess that they're probably maybe likely to sooner than they think. But, but that is part of that notion is just don't continue to expand an infrastructure. And, it, and it's, it's very tempting, especially in parts of the country that are depressed. Um, there's many small towns, unfortunately, out there that the mill closes, and now the biggest employer is the local hospital. So you will see, and Medicare has a policy notion, that, that if there's you know, not a hospital for another 50 miles, that they should allow, you know, that they will give bonus payments even though this hospital's at 50% capacity. Um, you know, those sorts of things. And then it all of a sudden becomes, an, it becomes a political question. That's the big employer in the area. The congressman will fight very, very hard to make sure that they get payments that, that 
are hard to economically justify other than, you know, if you consider Medicare a jobs program. So there's just these things you could do just to get it down to what, so that we spend within our, our income, not beyond it. Um, I just want to add to uh, a sort of physicians in the trench and, uh, trenches uh, perspective from walking around the exhibit uh, floor yesterday. You know, fixed costs are important. You know, my employer is the biggest employer in Massachusetts, um, but it's about 70 percent, we think, and 30 percent of $750 billion is a lot. So when I looked at some of the cool apps uh, as I was walking around and thinking about how it may or may not decrease readmissions, you know, the, the way I think about it is once the patient with congestive heart failure comes to the hospital, there's certain things that we can't help. The lights are already on. But uh, it may make a difference in terms of the discretionary things that I think about as a doctor, like whether or not that patient needs an echocardiogram again. Um, and so I think there is some low-hanging fruit there. There is an opportunity for savings. And, um, it might be because I'm still young and dewy-eyed, but I'm optimistic about it. Open it up to questions from the group. In thinking about lowering health care costs, one issue that you don't think any of you really directly uh, addressed was perhaps shifting responsibility for certain roles in, in the provider network. Uh, I know that uh, you know, with some specific health care uh, professions, there are limits that are placed by state governments and the licensure and all that. Uh, you know, how, how have you been considering this and how can these types of movements be incentivized if it can be shown that quality of care does not really suffer? One of the huge examples is in my field in obstetrics where you have, um, <laughs> is that what you were thinking? So, I mean, like you've got midwives um, that do a lot of deliveries, probably like 10, 15 percent, uh, and then MDs. And for the majority of healthy women in the country, um, you know, two very different philosophies around intervention. Six out of the 10 most common interventions, uh, according to the CDC, uh, in the United States are around childbirth. Uh, most common surgery that any American, not woman, any American will undergo is a cesarean section. Um, and, uh, you know, for the majority of healthy women, the outcomes are the same and the costs are very different because of sort of the approach towards interventions. Um, and so, you know, I think there's probably an opportunity there and, um, you know, part of that opportunity is going to be uh, having better information um, around some of those differences. For example, we don't really uh, have good ways of formally triaging patients one way or the other. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that's a, a well-taken point. Uh, and um, there's an opportunity to learn more about the best ways to take advantage of our sort of workforce. I would just um, echo that and add, I guess, I, I agree with your question. There are probably lots of opportunities, not only midwives, physician assistants, nurses, gatekeepers, technology. There's some exhibits downstairs I had not seen before where patients are coming in on the web and there's uh, somebody taking all the vitals and then some a physician talking to them. And it certainly promises potential efficiencies and perhaps savings. It may require some changes in laws, licenses, license laws and such, and probably definitely requires some changes in incentives. Um, how do you change this system and the reimbursement model to give people incentives to use that and to reimburse providers for, for doing that. And again, the best change in incentives is offloading risk. I mean, accountable care organizations, we could talk about other models, but the idea of giving a budget to somebody and letting them figure out the most efficient ways to deliver services, ideally with, with quality measures and everything else in place. So I think it's uh, an area of opportunity. Um, yeah, I just I look at it a little differently, not that the conclusion is that much different, but as you look across the various uh, aspects of health care and health care spending, there's certain areas, certain kind of targets of opportunity, if you want to think about that, where we see certain inefficiencies. For some reason, you're paying $150 for something that otherwise should probably in a well-functioning market would cost you 100 and sometimes that's, like I said, you know, sometimes that's political influence, keeps price, you know, payments up higher than you might think otherwise would make sense. Sometimes it's more a guild mentality. Uh, you know, you're talking about scope of practice laws. It's at the state level. Uh, it is a situation where there's, there are certain groups that, that restrict other people. You know, I saw it. I, I don't mean to 
there's any chiropractors in the, in the, in the audience. But, you know, they tried to get Medicare to make it that only, only chiropractors could do certain spinal manipulations. Now, ironically, that was the HMOs who came in and said, wait a second, we have physicians, we have, we have physical therapists, we have, you know, you're, you're giving them a monopoly over a particular procedure if you do this. And they were able to, to break it down. Typically what we've seen where those break down is because that is at the state level, is you'll see that sometimes in the federal programs, things like the VA, even the Indian Health Service. They're, ex they're experimenting with, a, with a, a program in the equivalent of kind of a dental medic in Alaska, because there's just, I mean, you wouldn't believe, you know, you get off the plane on some of the islands off the coast and you think you're in the third world. No adult over 30 has any teeth. Uh, and so, and, and the dentist is not hopping on a plane and going up for anchorage for that. So the Indian Health Service has come up with this sort of way of doing it and sort of somebody who can supply, you know, more than a hygienist, but not quite a, a DDS. Um, but it has to be done because they're feds and they can preempt state law. That's the only way they get around it. So once you can prove that in that federal sense, the VA, the Indian Health Service, then, you're ab then you have the evidence to say, did, what did that affect, you know, do a full evaluation. Did that affect quality of care? Did that affect spend? Did that affect how you do these things? And then, then you can start talking about projecting it. So we've, th this will be the last question because we've reached our time fence, but please. It's about technology in general, and I'm just trying to sort of reconcile. When you look at a MedPAC document or a CBO analysis, and they talk about technology as the sort of major driver of healthcare spending, but here we are at a technology conference where everybody's talking about the promise of technology to help us reduce or slow some of the spending. How do we reconcile that? I mean, which is right? Well, it's not a question of, of right or wrong. It's a notion that, that having worked at MedPAC earlier in my career, never at, at CBO, but having worked with them, um, they can get cynical at times because 20 people come in the door and 20 say they're going to save money and maybe one does. So they're trying to keep an open mind because there's always that one that does. But, but, it's, it's, but, but everybody, you know, nurse practitioners, I was going to save a ton. Well, it didn't. Physicians kept billing at the same rate, and so that net offset that was supposed to happen, all you had was more of a, you know, physician's assistant, same, same thing. So they can get kind of cynical about these things, and they're looking, as I say, they're counting certain things that other people might not count. It really is what is the taxpayer exposed to. That's what they're going to count. So it is those, I don't think that they keep a, a, a negative opinion, but lots of people come to Congress in the CBO sense with anecdotes. And anecdotes, it's not science. You know, you've got to come in with real data. That's why, I, that's why part of the reason I wanted to highlight these different methodologies is if you want to be persuasive in these areas, whether it's policy or it's, you know, just in business and, you know, get Netna to cover it, et cetera, et cetera, you have to have a persuasive, rigorous base, that evidentiary base that you can come forward to convince them. And they're not going to take it anymore just on, you know, luminary docs come in and say, I think this is a good idea, you should do it. It's just show me the data. Show me the money. I think I'll, I'll point you to the, the supplement that sits around here on the, on the tables that Josh Mackauer um, and uh, Steve Gottlieb did a great piece on the, the entrepreneur's proposition in lowering the cost of health care. And they're both med tech people who uh, have lived with this, Paul, that uh, it's in fact new technology which is driving up health care costs when in fact it, it never is. It's, it's almost the argument of guns don't kill people, people kill people. It's not the technology itself that is responsible for rising health care costs. It's, many times it's inappropriate utilization. And so um, when used appropriately, I think as, as Peter eloquently pointed out, it's like screening tests. When used appropriately, there's an opportunity to provide very high value health care. When used ubiquitously and nonsensically, uh, in fact, that, that's an opportunity for abuse and, and excess spending. So I, I think I, I'd leave you with the notion that um, mHealth, as you, as you hear as you walk around, um, it is often described as a solution for access to health care in, uh, in the third world. I'll point out that it's probably also in part a solution for excess in the first world, that we do have an opportunity to take um, and displace sites of care, displace um, uh, appropriately scale the person who's providing information with the need at hand and not always have the highest trained and most uh, costly per hour person addressing the concerns of everyone that we can tailor and do a better job of impedance matching. I think the opportunity is really in front of us. And when you think that 
The, the, um, the average doc will tell you 80% of the people they see in their clinic, they didn't need to see that day. When you say that 80% of the value of an office visit is simply in the information transfer. When you realize that 70% of Americans want to access their doctor through email, or that 60% um, say that they're willing to have information about them, physiologic information moved to their doc, you realize that the problem is that we don't have an incentive for the doc to get on email, to look at that data. We, we don't yet have the incentive systems in place to reap the enormous rewards that we have available to us. So with that, I'll leave you with that upbeat note, and thank you for coming.